past and generous board of directors are President Howard Levy, Vice President Owen Lewis, Secretary Carla Carlson, and our financial director and treasurer since 1999, Jeffrey Morehouse, along with Dorothy Tapper Goldman, Elizabeth Jackson, Dave Lee, Kimberly Nunes, Peter Shearson, and Calvin Way. Hard times, yes, but so much easier when we meet together like this. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. A little teary, but happy to see you all. I'm gonna turn this over now to um, one of our two associate directors, Ryan Murphy. Hello, everybody. Oh, hold on, let me try to. <laughs> we gotta see you. I see Maggie. All right. Uh, hello, everybody, I'm sorry. I'm working off of two screens to try to keep the Zoom thing going. Um, it's wonderful to have you all joining us tonight. I'm heartened to see so many familiar faces and to know that Four Way Books continues to do work that is vital to this community of readers and writers. Over the 15 years that I've been with the press, we have faced many challenges in an ever-changing landscape for nonprofits and book publishers alike. And in the same way that we've found a way to not only continue, but to expand our mission, I look forward to the next 15 years working together with all of you. You're about to hear what I consider some of the most dynamic and compelling poetry being written right now. And I want you to know that there's more exciting work to come in the months and years ahead. So thank you all. And I can't wait to look, and I look forward to the day that we can all be together again. And now Sally Ball, the other associate director, will say a few words. Thanks so much, guys. That's Joan Houlihan. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> That's I see. In my frame lit up. <laughs> okay. I, hi everybody. I share Martha and Ryan's deep joy and gratitude to see you all here tonight. I'm very excited about our forthcoming lists full of important pioneering virtuosic writers who offer both formal technical innovation and attention to subject matters that are massively resonant in contemporary American life. Things like environmental urgencies, caring for aging parents, toxic political discourse, urban and rural customs and mores, forgiveness, love, Queen Latifah, pediatric ICU. Our work on these books continues as we shelter in, place, in places, helping to invent and support this whole new realm of virtual connections between writers and readers. A while back, on our 20th anniversary, the LA Review of Books introduced a profile of us this way. New York has seen plenty of ruin over the last two decades, from the ash and debris of 9-11 to the wreckage of Hurricane Sandy. But for over 20 years, Four Way Books has also been building something of its own, a city within a city, something cognizant of, but impervious to, that ruin. A thriving small press, publishing some of the interesting, aesthetically diverse collections of poetry and fiction in the country. Because I work from afar for the last 20 plus years from Phoenix, Phoenix, rising from the ashes, I have remembered those earlier hard times during this quarantine and seen again the bedrock that books has to its people. And I felt the incredible circle of mutual care between staff, authors, readers, and supporters of all kinds. I'm grateful as ever, and more than ever, to be in the virtual room tonight. Thank you all for being here too. It's not even Zoomy Hollywood Squares. We are sending, it's, I don't know, 90 postage stamps of literary <laughs> light. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to our publicity director, Clarissa Long. Hi, thank you, Sally, and thank you everyone everyone for being here. Um, I'm so thrilled to see all of your beautiful faces um, and to welcome you to our first ever Zoom benefit. Um, of course, I wish we were all together in person, um, but it's still really great on, to Clarissa, you're see you up. here. Clarissa, um, you're breaking we know up. That this yep. You're breaking up. 
okay, I don't know what to do. <laughs> All right. Arthur? I can try again. Or I can turn so, over. If some of us turn off our videos, it might actually go better. Less okay. bandwidth. Or just okay. sound, because sometimes the sound will block the speaker. Yeah, yeah, why don't you mute yourselves? Okay. Good. Then I can sew in the plastic. Let's see here. Um, many of us, um, and that most of our hours are spent in Zoom, and Zoom can be very exhausting, to say the least. Um, so really appreciate your being here, making the time for another Zoom event, um, and for all the ways that you're supporting us right now. Um, it does not go unnoticed, and we greatly appreciate it. If you're comfortable with it, we'd love for you to keep your video on so we can keep seeing your beautiful faces throughout the event but of course that's up to you um, as we were just discussing muting can help with uh, background noise so we're gonna keep everyone on mute um, throughout uh, but if you're speaking or you're reading or asking a question of course unmute yourself um, so the setup is we're going to have a discussion um, and the discussion will be facilitated by Matthew Alsman. Um, and so first he will ask a few questions of the authors and then we will open it up for audience questions. Um, and at that point, I will um, write to everyone in the chat box saying that you can type your question in the chat box. Um, and one at a time, I will ask those with questions to unmute and ask their question. Um, and we'll carry on in that way. Um, so our three readers tonight are three of our spring 2020 authors, Tommy Blount, Allison Venice White, and John Murillo. So without further ado, let's get started. Our first reader, Tommy Blount, is a Cave Canem alumnus and the author of Fantasia for the Man in Blue and What We Are Not For. A graduate of the MFA program for writers at Warren Wilson College, he has been the recipient of scholarships and fellowships from Kresge Arts in Detroit and Breadloaf Writers Conference. Born and raised in Detroit, now lives in the nearby suburb of Novi, Michigan. You there, Tommy? I'm here. You can go ahead and uh, un I'm unmuted. Hi, everybody. Um. First of all, thank you all for being here. Four Away, thank you so much for uh, like giving me a book. Um, and um, yeah, phonophobia. Body cam footage, the crackle and chirp of it anyway. I'm within earshot. I know it is about to happen again. Click the news site's window closed. Open my window to geese barking a path across the man-made pond. The pond plopped near a quiet suburban lane. One flops over, pops up with a spray of grass in its beak. It turns its bearded head away to the road's new pitch. An ice cream truck blares the white noise of an old American song. The tune whips the air in my mouth into vanilla soft serve. Once, back in Detroit, my brother sent me out to shout for the Mr. Softy truck, two cones. So I said, little brother, where's the other cone? You should have two. He always starts, and upon hearing the beat, I chime in with, so then I said, I had two, but yours went splat on the ground. I just started slurping away on the other cone. None of this ever truly rings a bell for me. I never remember, yet want to remember. So I rattle off the learned script so that he can laugh. Then I can laugh harder, which makes him laugh even harder until we both bark and crack up with tears streaming down our faces. We are so happy then. The guffaws, the chuckles, just one big snicker. We can't stop laughing. We laugh until we can't breathe. You'd think 
we are dying. The purse thieves. There was the arm, the black pricey number barely on her white shoulder in broad daylight. Why first did she have to look to my face when she screamed stop? I did nothing except look up from the gas pump. Yes, held tight as a gun before I looked back down again to witness nothing only my shadow. I saw nothing, just two boys who favored me when I was that age and always mistaken for being older. I mean, I felt nothing except that my body was not my body anymore. Stomach shoved aside to make room for two more. I was an animal raised to be slaughtered in the name of a pricey leather number dangling from a shoulder to be stolen. It all happened so fast. My shadow bled into their shadows for a moment, a second, an eye blink as we fled across the lot. We were at play together in a race like brothers. And like brothers, just like that, the shadows broke apart and we were separated again. I saw nothing, only their bodies slid back, slid into the back of a white van and I slid back into the white car as if I might chase them down to save them or I don't know. I did nothing. I brought both hands to my face. I heard the white band's wheels peel the afternoon like a mask I thought could never be removed, a skin. When the police sirens grew larger, I pulled my hands from my face, placed them on the steering wheel. It's so strange not hearing anybody too. It's so weird. <laughs> You're amazing, Tommy. I know it's. <laughs> um, yeah, this is my last poem. Not an elegy for Eric Rhodes. You could have just as easily fit another body inside this poem that isn't a white man, shaved and muscular, whose storyline it seems is always to be the cop with a weakness for the perpetrator pinned to the ground in such a way that it sounds as if he cannot breathe, the throat locked under the glazed forearm. The perpetrator, is black and so are you. Yet you insist on giving the shiny star another scene in which to shoot his wad one more time when the scene of the crime is full of wadded bodies whom you too could be mistaken for, shot then shot on a video in another kind of blue movie. Tommy, don't you wonder if you've worshipped his white body enough by spilling yours. Thank you. Fierce, fierce, Tommy. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Read the chat, Tommy. The people love you. <laughs> oh, I can't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> really great reading. Thank you. Um, our next reader is Allison Bennis White the author of four poetry collections, most recently, The Wendy's. She is an associate professor at the University of California, Riverside. Her awards include the Levis Prize in Poetry, selected by Claudia Rankine, the Rilke Prize, and the Cleveland State University Poetry Center Book Prize. Are you there, Allison? I'm here. Excellent. Take it away. All right. Okay, so am I in speaker view here? Does everything look okay, Clarissa? Okay, excellent. Uh, greetings. 
Uh, greetings, everybody um, from quarantine in California. I uh, hope you're all well and safe um, during this incredibly bewildering and challenging time. And it's, it's so crazy to see everybody's faces. It's like I feel so heartened by it um, and, and also so much longing uh, to be with you all in person. Thank you so much for coming out. And uh, I just have to say to Tommy, amazing reading, and I love your Golden Girls t-shirt. So bravo on both, on both accounts. Um, I'm going to read five brief poems from um, my most recent collection, Out From Four Way, which I, I also should say I, I could not be more grateful to be part of the Four Way Books family. I always say that when I would go to AWP before um, my book was selected for the Levis Prize, Four Way was always a first stop and always I felt like it was the cool kids um so I don't feel like a cool kid but uh, I feel definitely in proximity so thank you so uh this this book the Wendy's is in five sections and um each section is focused on uh, a different Wendy there's Wendy O. Williams from the, she's a lead singer of the cosmetics um Wendy Given who's a contemporary photographer Wendy Torrance from The Shining, Jack's wife. Wendy Caulfield, who was the first uh, located victim of the Green River Killer in Kent, Washington, and uh, Peter Pan's Wendy Darling. Um, you might be thinking, that's cool, I guess, but why would you do that? Good question. Um, well, my, uh, my mother, who's um, been absent for the majority of my life, is named Wendy. And um, though I'm loath to admit it, uh, she or her absence has always been my, um, my muse, my obsession. And my first response to that admission is, is always shame, but, um, but that's not really the way obsession works or the way grief works. We don't really get to choose. Um, so I'm going to read from the Wendy Given section, and uh, again, she's a contemporary photographer, and the poems from this section um, were written in a response to a series of her photographs, and they're, they're mainly um, landscape photographs of forests, um, of forests, and, uh, but each photograph sort of exists in search of a missing woman. So I'm going to read you uh, the epigraph from that section, which was taken from Wendy Gibbons' website about this particular series of photographs. Um, one can begin to imagine so many possibilities as to what befell this sleeping, injured, or dead character as she made her way through the woods at night. The track. Of course, it is the absence that is so beautiful. Human or animal, the snow will fall and cover her tracks. Maybe each word is a footprint filling up with snow. I was here, meaning I am disappearing. The shades. At first glance, the trunk in the river looks like a body floating face down, naked. After you died, I saw you everywhere, which is not uncommon. Several times a day, I'd say to myself, her eyes, skin, hands, like yours. I'd say to myself, but not you, until everyone became more and more not you, until you were no one, nowhere, meaning everyone, everywhere. Ignis Fatus, which is Kind of as a, it's a light that sometimes appears over marshy ground, and they, they think it's um, that the faint light is from the combustion of decomposing material. So it's sort of like a little bit of light from death. Ignis fatus. 
It is possible to be lovely in the dark. A few thin trees leaning toward each other. In ghost or pale light, my fingers on my lips. If to speak is to die, I will whisper. If to speak is to die, I will make trees of my hands. I will say nothing by shivering. I will say everything. Two more. She. Even in the dream, we lie awake in the dark, side by side. When I ask if you're dead, you say, alive in your mind. And of the four truths, I remember two. We are alone. We will suffer. It's no wonder we cannot sleep. We cannot die. Your cool hand in my hand, carved from ivory or ice. This is the last one. Waldgeist, which is a, a woodland sprite. The souls trapped in the trees in Dante's forest of suicides can only speak when their branches are broken as they bleed. What else is language now but injury? Why did you break me? Why did you leave me? And relief to bleed in one place for one reason, to say I failed to live sanely on earth without you. Yay, thank you, Allison. Thank you, for yourself. thank you. Again, the people love you. All the chats for you. <laughs> Um, our final reader is John Murillo. His much anticipated second collection, Contemporary American Poetry, follows his debut, Up Jump the Boogie, just reissued from Four Way Books. He has received many honors, including fellowships from Cave Canem and the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. He is an assistant professor of English at Wesleyan University and also teaches in the low residency MFA program at Sierra Nevada College. You there, John? I am here. Excellent. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you for, uh, well, not coming out. Thank you for staying in, actually. Um, but thank you for showing up and being here. Um, we would have liked to have been there with you in person to be able to hug and uh, toast and uh, auction and, and all the, the things, but uh, it's good that you were here together um, and get to experience each other a different way. Um, also, thank you to everybody at Four Way. I mean, it's not been an easy time for anyone, um, but you guys have handled it like pros, really. And I feel supported, I feel loved, and thank you guys for everything you're doing. Um, know that you are appreciated. Um, I'm gonna read two poems now. Um, one is uh, the first poem in the book actually, it's called On Confessionalism. Not sleepwalking, but waking still with my hand on a gun and the gun in a mouth and the mouth on the face of a man on his knees. Autumn of 89, and I'm standing in a Section 8 apartment parking lot pistol cot and staring down at this man, then up into the mug of an old woman staring, watering the single sad flower to the left of her stoop, the flower also staring. My engine idling behind me, a slow moaning bass line and the bark of a dead rapper nudging me on all to say someone's brokenhearted. And this man with the gun in his mouth, this man who, like me, is really little more than a boy. 
This man who, like me, is really little more than a boy may or may not have something to do with it, may or may not have said a thing or two, betrayed a secret, say, that walked my love away. And why not say it? She adored me. And I, her, more than anyone, anything in life up to then and then still for two decades after and therefore went for broke. Blacked out and woke having gutted my piggy and pawned all my gold to buy what a homeboy said was a Beretta. Blacked out and woke my hand on a gun, the gun in a mouth, a man who was really a boy on his knees. And because I loved the girl, I actually paused before I pulled the trigger. Once, twice, three times, then panicked, not just because the gun jammed, but because what if it hadn't? Because who did I almost become there that afternoon in a Section 8 apartment parking lot pistol cocked with the sad flowers staring? Because I knew the girl I loved, no matter how this all played out, would never have me back. Day of damaged ammo or grime that clogged the chamber, Day of faulty rods or springs come loose in my fist. Day nobody died. So why not hallelujah, say amen, or thank you? My mother sang for years of God, babes, and fools. My father, lymph-node masses fading from his x-rays, said surviving one thing means another comes and kills you. He's dead, and so I trust him. Dead, and so I'd wonder years about the work I left undone. Boy on his knees, a man now, risen, and likely plotting his long way back to me. Fuck it. I tucked my tool like the movie gangsters do and jumped back in my bucket. Cold enough day to make a young man weep. Afternoon when everything or nothing changed forever. The dead rapper grunted, the bass line faded. My spirits whispered something from the trees. I left then lost the pistol in a storm drain, somewhere between that life and this. Left the pistol in a storm drain, but never got around to wiping away the prince. Let me get some water. The gin and tonic is good, but it's not really hydrating me. Um, you guys should be drinking yourselves too, uh, uh, benefit. So imagine you're at the thing. It's like a fancy waiter with a plate with a hors d'oeuvres and, and drink. I just got a gin and tonic from the waiter before he passed me by. Um, this next poem I'm gonna read is called Contemporary American Poetry. And it's the title of the book, but in the book, it's actually written, uh, spelled correctly. Um, we were going to spell it like that on the cover, but we were afraid that maybe people might think it was an anthology, very, very thin anthology of only one writer, maybe, um, or a critical text. Uh, so we decided to change up the, uh, the, the spelling and the title. Um, what do you need to know about this? Nothing much. I will say this, though. Um, I um, name check Don Sharon here, uh, the publisher of Poetry Magazine. And um, I've noticed sometimes that when I read this um, aloud, people laugh when they hear his name as if I was dissing Don Sharon, but it's not this at all. I actually ran this poem by him before I published it. And um, so he's all good with it. So I think that's it. Contemporary American Poetry. And thank you guys for listening.
Another Monday and you're out with some poets, one of whom maybe you has just given a reading and it's summer and it's Brooklyn or it's the village and it's winter and you've landed at some dusky, dusty dive bar crowded around an eight top to order wings, shots, and what not when halfway down the table you hear one poet congratulate a second on some prize or another, while a third sulks, sips his gimlet, and pretends not to listen, and a fourth mumbles something about not being notified his application was even received, and how you have to be gay or black or both to win anything these days. And a fifth poet pushes a plate of nachos toward you and asks what you think about the state of contemporary American poetry. And before you can answer a sixth prize in, mishearing, of course, the last few syllables and waxes cerebral, something about Don share or plowshares or maybe even timeshares. And on the television mounted, hanging overhead, an anchor woman's mouthing the muted news of another boy shot dead and black in some city now burning. And the police chief promises a thorough investigation. And a Yemeni woman is burning, splashed with acid for loving who she chooses. And everywhere you think is burning, 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 burning. And yes, you hear a graduate student quip between slurps about a newly dead master. I tried to like his work, may he rest in peace. But try as I might, I found him too accessible. Another Monday and it's summer in Brooklyn, or it's the village and winter. You're with the poets one of whom the political poet, the outsider poet, has brought along a selfie stick. You put your shot glass to your mouth. What's inside is burning, burning. Everybody now, squeeze in tight. Everybody now, say cheese. Thank you so much, John. That was amazing. You should read the chats too. <laughs> thank you. And thank you again to Tommy and Allison. That was really, really great. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our facilitator, the wonderful poet and person, Matthew Olsman. He's the author of three collections of poems, including Constellation Root, forthcoming from Alice James Books. He teaches at Dartmouth College and in the MFA program for writers at Warren Wilson College. You there, Matthew? I'm here. Do you hear me? Did I unmute myself? Yes, you're perfect. All right. So, well, thank you. Uh, first, I wanted to start by thanking all three of you for those readings. I've been looking forward to this event for uh, a couple months, and that was wonderful. Um, I suppose I also want to thank you all for intentionally releasing these books during a pandemic so that we all might have excellent things to read to get us through these days. That was uh, very generous of you all. And um, I'm grateful to have been invited to uh, start off this Q&A session. So I've got a, a question or two uh, for, for the three of you, and then I think uh, Cl Clarissa will turn to the audience. But this first question is for, um, uh, for uh, all of you uh, to, co to consider or answer in any way you choose. Um, Alice, in your, poem, in your poem, She, the speaker says, and of the four truths, I remember two. We are alone, we will suffer. Tommy, one of your lines was, I never remember, yet want to remember. John, there's a line in your poem, um, Mercy, Mercy Me, I think that says, maybe memory is all the home you get. So my question is kind of, I was thinking about how, how these books sort of connect in that way and the relationship, and was wondering about the relationship between memory and your work. And that question can either be about the poems you, uh, in these collections or about the poems you're writing now or thinking about writing. For example, in this pandemic where people are mostly staying in one place and one day might resemble the previous day. Do you I find- I rose there. Oh, sorry, where was I? Am I still no, frozen? No, no, you're not frozen uh, uh, on everyone's thing, I think. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I was asking, can, can, you, can you still hear me, John? 
Yeah. All right, I was asking kind of about the relationship between memory and your work, and that, that question might either be about the poems you've already written or the poems you're writing now. Uh, for example, in a pandemic where people are mostly staying in place and one day might resemble the previous day, if you find yourself relying more solely on memory, or is this a time where you feel more compelled to look out at the world and which is changing in previously unthinkable ways? Somehow I'm the only one not on mute, so <laughs> I will I will answer. Um, I think I think it's somewhere in between for me. Um, not so much memory or looking out, but sort of moving into my imagination a little bit more. Um, as far as I think I'm responding to your question. Um, as far as like what what the writer does during this time or what I I've, I've done. Um, but also I think creative work is hard to come by right now. Um, feel like just to concentrate is challenging and to speak is challenging um, about anything but like what's actually happening. But I'll say this and move along um, to Tommy or John. I was, I, before the pandemic, I was writing a series of postcard poems from a speaker who was at a motel and sort of escaping um, our relationship and now those postcards are being written from home. It didn't make sense to have a speaker anywhere but in her home. I'll, yeah, I'll answer too. Um, I haven't been really creating any new work, but um, the idea of memory has been haunting me. Um, specifically as it pertains to um, grief, um, grief of all types. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, the, the sort of subtle griefs of like, you know, our lives are changed now, but I'm also thinking about like, you know, people I've lost, close, close family members that I've lost. Um, and, um, and I've also been thinking about uh, memory's relationship to the truth of an experience um, and the ways in which um, in poetry, not specifically mine, I've been reading a lot of Louise Glick lately and um, like I'm reading the big whole, you know, the big collected thing and one of the you know, she writes a lot. She writes a lot about a um, a a life that is that is possibly closely connected to her life. I mean, she names her son, and she names you know all these different people in it. And um, I don't know. It just it just makes me think about um, what the importance of um, being truthful to an experience is in art. Um, how how truthful do we need to be? to an experience, do we even need to, to be uh, truthful to an experience, but specifically speaking to memory, a past experience. Um, yeah, those, if I have to, yeah, that's, how, that's the way I've been, I guess, grappling with memory right now. I didn't think of it that way, but that's actually the way I've been thinking about it. I hope I answered it, Matt. Hi, Matt. <laughs> Hi, Tommy. You answered it. <laughs> um, of late, I've not really been engaging memory with what I've been writing. I've just been, I mean, drafting and kind of fooling around. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, because the first two books were steeped in memory so deeply, I was uh, kind of ready to get away from that, you know? Um, been talking a lot about myself for the better part of 20 years and you know even getting tired of my own voice so what i've been trying lately uh persona um ekphrastic work um things like that um but you know for this book memory was a big part of it you know and that line maybe memory is all the home we get i started to think about this um differently because what i noticed was that even in constructing memories or trying to draw from memories 
uh, I was filling in a lot of uh, blind spots uh, with lies, you know, to, to, to be blunt, not even knowing that I was doing so, because I think that over time, uh, what one might do is we, we build up a legend of ourselves. Yeah. And um, maybe we do this as a way of, of um, living with ourselves, you know, who we've been. Um, we might imagine ourselves more courageous than we are, otherwise are, or more noble, these things. So um, I don't know. I think that the book ends up being a, a, um, a book written in persona, right? And I think of Borges and his, uh, Borges and I, right, this public and private self. I think that for, my, for me, um, there's a private self that I've even um, maybe hid from my own self, right? So there are two private selves, so one private and one even more private. Um, and maybe that's something I'll be discovering in future work, but right now I'm more interested in it's kind of getting out, out of, you know, kind of putting the eye down for a while and seeing what else can be done. All right, thank you. Um, I've got uh, one more question for, for you all. Um, John, I was thinking of a, your poem, uh, a poem in your book called A Refusal to Re Mourn the Deaths by Gunfire of Three Men in Brooklyn. And Tommy, you read a poem um, called Not an El Elegy for Eric Rose. And Allison, there's a line in your collection that stuck with me long after reading it. It is grief to come to in a black room. Uh, at different points, each of these books have uh, different relationships to grief, being overwhelmed by grief or attempting to fortify the self against it. And I'm wondering if you three might talk about your uh, approach to the elegiac. Is it the, is it the job of the elegy to publicize grief? Is it a type of purging of grief, a catharsis? Or is it a way to allow someone else, per us, perhaps some anonymous reader somewhere else, uh, a new way to examine, uh, experience, or understand grief, or is it something altogether else altogether? I'll answer. Um, in my book, grief has a um, the elegy um, or the elegiac um, has a very strong um, like the book is built around it. Um, There was a traumatic incident that happened where I was, you know, um, where I was pulled over by the police um, twice, um, and um, and so the way that I found um, to deal with that in terms of art was eventually to sort of um, recontextualize and and replay that traumatic those two traumatic events over and over again. Um, until I was far enough away from it to, um, to make art of it, um, which is probably how I found my way into the elegiac um, mindset that pervades the book. Um, and um, yeah, for me, the, the elegy See, I don't want to. I don't want to be prescriptive and say the elegy is this because I've seen it do many things. Um, you know, I wrote a, a, a sort of a kind of anti-elegy uh, with not an elegy for Eric Rhodes, um, but I do think that for me, what connects the many different types of elegies that I have seen, um, or at least the way that I like to approach it, is there is there's always something that is lost. Um, for me, that all that often takes the shape of like um, desire, which I think is a kind of um, a kind of grief of not necessarily having lost something, but realizing you don't have something. Um, I guess is how I kind of um, internalize that in my own poem. So. Thanks, Tommy. Uh, I'll jump in. Um, I don't, maybe I should not I don't have an answer prepared. <laughs> I'll just freestyle it. Um, I don't know. Uh, does the allergy help us to process grief? 
I don't know that I'm really thinking about that when I'm writing. I don't even, it's only after the fact and looking back that I consider my work elegiac, elegiac, right? Um, I play the notes that are given me, yeah. And um, it's funny because I, I was thinking recently, um, if I look at the two books side by side, the backs of the books, right, the author photos, and the first book, you know, I'm kind of young and fly, got the hat tilted to the side, and then I look at this, I'm like, yo, what happened? Like 10 years later, and I'm like, this guy's so sad, look at his eyes. And it reminded me of, um, I recently came into contact with a friend of mine I knew from high school, and I was known as, or she remembered me as that sad boy, boy that just looks sad all the time. And um, I think the writing comes from there, you know, it's just uh, in writing in the mode that I was um, led into by my early influences, right? The, we call it the confessional mode or the um, lyric narrative mode, right? Um, you know, one tells one's own stories. They just happen to be, you know, uh, blue. Um, but I think of Elegy, you know, for me, when I do think of it as uh, a way of paying tribute, right, a way of documenting it and saying these people were here. Um, I think of the, the essay um, by Larry Levis, Mock Mockers After That, about the Elegy, and he starts it off with that quote. I'm not sure from who he's quoting, but um, the line, and it's a short poem, right? It's Elegy, who would I show it to, right? And it's this idea of, um, using pain, using someone's life, you know, for uh, art and maybe even for the sake of profit. And, you know, I, you know, I think sometimes about the ethics of that, but really, you know, it's, it's just saying this person was here, you know, and, you know, the books are filled with that. Um, it's hokey, I think, uh, at least for me, to kind of overplay that whole, uh, you know, witness and advocate thing, right? I, I write for those who can't, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think there is something to that um, that, you know, I've, I've come up with a lot of people who are not here and, you know, the elegy is, is a way to, to say that they were at one time. Thank you, uh, John and Tommy for your beautiful answers. Um, so appreciate that. And, and specifically, John, what you said um, that we play the notes we're given. It's really resonant for me as well. Um, and, you know, for, in terms of like one personal life and, and how that directs, you know, the playing, um, you know, my, my mother disappeared when I was one. And so my whole life has been, I don't remember not being in a space of grief, although I couldn't name that. Um, it was just the lens through which I saw and that I lived and, and I'm so fortunate to be able to have language. I was thinking of uh, that Lisa uh, Mueller line, or Mueller, excuse me, um, I put grief in the mouth of language because it was the only thing that would grieve with me. And it's such a, an amazing, resonant, I think, way to think about grief that, um, like John said, it's, it's a way of saying this person was here. It's, a, it's an act of love. Um, but it's also, I think, a seeking of company uh, to share in, in the grief, um, especially what you said, John, about uh, private selves having more than one private self. That's fascinating to me, uh, the private self, and then the even more deeply private self. I've never thought about it quite that way before, and I think that's the space I come from, um, that more deeply private space in, in my writing. That, that doesn't have company except for in language. And, um, and I like also the idea that, um, that grief is love with nowhere to go. Um, and, that, and that the poems for me are somewhere for the love to go. And, uh, and lastly, you know, I was just reading a student's manuscript that focused on the, uh, the loss of her grandfather. And um, I was so comforted by her poems and I was reminded how, because uh, sometimes I think, gosh, like, what does my grief mean to anyone else? Um, and I was reminded that this grief is, is overlapping and, uh, and interconnected. And, uh, and, it, and I felt her love for her grandfather. And in that, I was buoyed in my own losses um, and in my own position as a human being in this world, especially right now, um, when it's all, it, there's, we're all grieving. 
Um, my husband, uh, he says, which is a dangerous thing to say, uh, at least initially, he said there are two kinds of people, those that are grieving and those who don't know they're grieving. Mm. And uh, I think that that rings true, true to me. So thank you for your question, Matt. Much appreciated. And thank you, Tommy and John, for your, your answers. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, Clarissa, did you have, had you been, have you been gathering questions? I was just gonna ask, um, so now I'd like to open it up to any audience questions. Um, if you do have a question, you can type it in the chat box um, and you can, we're gonna unmute one by one um, as the questions come in. Um, maybe while we wait here, do you have any more questions, Matthew? Oh, I always have questions. But, Excellent. Um, <laughs> you know, um, uh, a couple of you talked a little bit about about like the titles of your book, John. You're you're talking about the the sp the spelling and uh, Alice and the diff the different Wendy's and um and. Uh, this question is kind of thinking about the, these books as a, as whole collections rather than any like one issue in it. And I, I admired how the titles of these books worked in different ways, you know, whether acting as a sort of binding agent or creating a, a sort of sense of cohesion among the poems um, or directing the reader's atten attention toward a particular uh, aspect of the book or a various type of subtext. And I was wondering if, uh, if you guys might uh, talk about how these collections became uh, books of poems or how you navigate the relationship between the poem as an individual piece of art but also a thing that fits into a broader context when placed among uh, among these other poems can you repeat the question Matt please sure I, I was just thinking about how these books came together and I started thinking about that in terms of like the titles and how the titles were directing the reader's attention to different aspects of the of the books but uh, the question was then about like how 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 these collections became books of poems like how you navigated the relationship between the poem as an individual piece of art on its own but also a thing that then fits into a larger context when placed in a collection with other poems uh i'll jump in i just finished up a semester uh teaching and one of the uh the duties that we have is to um to kind of guide a student or two through a, a senior thesis or an honors thesis, you know, whichever the case might be. And, you know, often these students, they come to the project thinking of it as a project, right? You know, with um, these really lofty goals in mind. And it was just cool, you know, but I, I try to get them to think of, um, think of themselves as a DJ, right? You know, so when you're putting together a manuscript, you're kind of putting together a set list, right? But you have to have records to spend first. So, you know, there's no sense in me planning out a set list of these records don't even exist yet, right? So um, for me, it's a kind of a two-step process where one, I'm just writing poems individually. And then once they start to kind of speak to each other and they might, you know, lead to other poems, then you have something you can actually look at and start to think about sequencing and, and which poems might be able to make the cut, which poems will not. Are there poems that are doing double work, right? Are these two poems kind of getting at the same idea or using some of the same imagery, which is more effective? Maybe a better poem doesn't make it into the manuscript because it just, you know, you know, we're looking at this as a uh, now a, a whole entity. You know, it's, it's not doing the, the the right kind of work. You know, so it's like having a I don't know a nice pocket square, this the bomb pocket square, right? but it just doesn't fit with like a cool camel coat, you know, like uh, one might wear when hosting a, an event. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, go ahead, Tommy, please. <laughs> no, I, um, yeah, with me, it, um, it actually, <laughs> it actually came together right uh, kind of quickly. So the, the, how can I talk about this? 
So technically the, the title poems came first um, because I, I wrote them, I wrote them a while ago in like chunks and, um, and I worked on those poems individually. I wasn't even thinking about the book at all, like at all. Um, and then I was driving home from work one evening and it, I'm weird. It dawned on me because I was thinking about all, all these, all the poems that I had and it dawned on me that, um, the, the title poem, um, uh, or the title poems sort of were in conversation with all of the other poems, like the different parts, because it's, it's, uh, for, um, um, it's for uh, poems, it's a series of poems. Um, and so it just, I mean, it just dawned on me that this, this poem needs to be the spine of the book um, because um, I wanted there to be, I wanted the, the, I wanted there to be this sense of like returning to the site of of trauma and revisiting it and like um replaying it in a different way um almost cinematically and um i was going to say something else yeah uh, returning to it and and replaying it and um and then i knew that i and i knew that i wanted to return to it um similar to what john was saying about um you know a, a, set list I think in terms of like movies that I've seen and um the structure of films that I that I love um when I was putting this one together um which is another reason why there's this sort of like replaying um or revisioning the same event over and over again and coming out with different results um Let's see, what else do I want to say? Yeah, that's all I'll say. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, I, I've been obsessed with the book length series um, since I was an undergraduate, since Tommy was talking about uh, Louise Glick. Uh, when I read The Wild Iris, I was forever destroyed and changed. And uh, also uh, Killarney Clary's Who Whispered Near Me, I was just like, that's what I, I want to do that. Um, I was just, I was so fascinated and enthralled by the ability to sustain, uh, to sort of fan out um, and circle around um, something in a singular way uh, that deepened and deepened and deepened. Um, but I would also recognize the challenge of that. Um, and, uh, but that's the way I, I, I like to write. It's the most comfortable, most challenging, most engaging way for me to write. And I think, like I was saying about the LaSalle Muller quote, it's, it's company for me um, to have the poems kind of consciously be gathered together. Um, and with the Wendy's, I mean, it, I started with Wendy Darling, um, in part, obviously my mother's name is Wendy and she chose the name Wendy because of, um, it's a whole long story. Her name is Trudy and her father died. She was adopted by her stepfather who she hated. And so they bribed her and they said, you can choose your own first name um, uh, and, because you're getting a new birth certificate. So she chose the name Wendy because of Peter Pan, um, because of Wendy Darling. So I started with Wendy Darling and uh, just to see what would happen. And, uh, and it worked, um, meaning the poems had heat and communicated something back to me and um and my husband I, but, I, but my time with my husband I mean it's like this is my world now it's made him um as I know for all of you it's something similar um if we're so fortunate um but I knew that the Wendy Darling I couldn't write a whole book of those poems they just couldn't couldn't be sustained so he's like well what about other Wendy's and he's like Wendy Torrance from The Shining and I was like oh yeah so I started looking into other Wendy's and with, with, without great hope, just with curiosity. And, um, and so I, I, I studied these other Wendy's and tried to find moments of, of vulnerability, of connection, um, uh, windows. And, um, and it, 
and it worked. It, it worked on a fairly regular basis. Um, the only one that didn't work was Wendy Wasserstein, the playwright. I read every freaking play that she's ever written and biography, all this stuff, but I could not find an intersection with her. Um, but but I still didn't know if the book would work. I mean, so only when I put them all together and kind of figured out the order of the sections could I see if it had a symphonic effect. Um, and uh, and happily, from I feel that it that it did. Um, and somebody wrote to me about the book and said it's used the the verb which I had never heard before, ex excoriating, like you're pulling the bark from a tree. And that's the way he described what the sections were doing, and that seemed right to me. But none of this is is conscious, and none of this is um, certain. Um, it's all exploration and discovery, and um, yeah, and, and hope, I guess, uh, a little bit of hope that, um, that, that I can make something that lives. And, um, but thank you for your question, Matthew, very much. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Um, I have uh, two audience questions here. Uh, first from Rebecca Faust and then Nathan McLean. Um, so Rebecca, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask? Sure, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's just a general question about how confinement has affected your writing practice. I'm, I'm interested in how it's affected your creative work, um, good or bad. Um, I will say that it, I suppose it's affecting it badly, um, I would say. Uh, there's, I'm, I'm so busy trying to figure out how to teach online and teaching online. And um, we, and we've had two deaths in the family, if you can believe that, COVID unrelated. So this time has just been a really complicated time of um, transition mm -hmm. and, uh, and grieving in the, I mean, it's bananas. Um, but I'm writing just the tiniest bit. And it's, and it's, it's not the only joy that I have, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a joy, like just to be able to go into my imagination, even in the most, in the briefest sense. Um, I'm writing four line poems. Um, so I think whatever that constriction is, uh, or pressure is of this quarantine, it feels like that's the only way that it's, it's emerging. How about you, Tommy? Um, yeah. Um, Allison, sorry to hear that. Um, um, for me, it has uh, pretty much stifled it. Um, part of my, my process, and I'm like a, I wouldn't say I'm a homebody, I'm more misanthropic slightly. Um, but, um, but my writing practice has always um, encompassed me leaving my house and going to specific uh, places around Detroit, like specific places and specific chairs and cafes, like mm -hmm. specific corners and yeah. specific libraries. Um, and so now um, it just all feels just, I don't even know how to describe it. It just, it's, it's sad. However, um, I am reading a lot more than I was before. Um, which is probably definitely, you know, of course, I mean, it's helping me. Um, but as far as writing, I just can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it in my apartment. Maybe, yeah, I know I need to move. That was, that's always, I need to move. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's completely stifled it. Yeah, because we spend a lot of time carving out our spaces that worked. And suddenly those spaces have changed. Absolutely. I really like the idea of sh composing short poem, short four line poems that kind of mimic the confinement that we're feeling. But yeah, I'm having trouble too because the spaces that, that I spent so much time carving out and that worked, are they no longer exist. Yeah. I am. Um... Thank you for your question, Rebecca. And Allison, um, deep condolences for your losses. Um, I don't know, you know, for me, um, like this all sucks, right? It, it, it sucks, yeah. 
But two things about that. One, I, for some reason, I don't know why, but I have this deeply held faith that we will see the other side of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not based on anything that I can put my hands on, but I just something in me just, we're going to see the other side of it, right? That said, um, there's going to be a time when I look back on this and we'll, we'll want to have used this time wisely. So what I've been doing, I've been getting up every morning at six to write and I sit down for about four hours and um, nothing really substantial has come, nothing useful even. I have, you know, like pages and pages of lines, you know, but none of this will probably see the light of day, any of this, yeah. But it's practice. And that's what I've been doing, I've been practicing. I, I, I give myself exercises, I practice meter, I practice sound devices, I practice with uh, metaphor and figurative tropes, I practice with concrete imagery, I read. So, you know, it's, it's work, it's all work. So um, that's what I've been doing. And uh, yeah, maybe nothing comes out of it, but uh, I hope that I'm getting better, if nothing else. And I've been reading as well, I've been reading. Um, so that so it's been you know but I'm only about a, a couple weeks into this. We just finished up classes last week. Uh, classes, yeah, um, and uh, yeah. So so that's what I've been doing. So it's it's changed my practice in that I'm very conscious of using the time that I I have faith that won't always be available to me because we'll get back to you know having to leave the house and having to spread your time and energy uh, among all these other obligations. So, you know, while we're here, um, yeah, I'm trying to, trying to get busy. Great idea to do exercises. I really love the reading. It's the best Zoom reading I've been to so far. It's, it was amazing. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. Um, for our last question, Nathan McLean, you want to ask? I feel like this is like the big letdown because it's my question. <laughs> um, so I'm just really curious about the role of music in generating and revising your work because when I was reading Tommy's book, I kept hearing like libretto between the characters that each of the poems were representing. And John, I'm sorry, I haven't read your whole book, but I've read many poems of yours and read your last book. And I know that music really seems to be present, especially when you make a big turn in a poem or something has just been revealed and then music comes in. Um, and Allison, in your book, the breathlessness, the pauses, the moments where music doesn't appear. I just, I'm just curious as to how that worked for you in your process and just whatever you want to say about that, you know. Love you guys. Hey, what's your name? That's JJ. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, welcome, welcome. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I don't know. Music, I don't know, when, I, when I'm writing, I don't really tend to listen to a lot of music while I'm writing, but it's always in the house, it's always a part of, it's been a part of my life. Um, my first poets were uh, singers, songwriters, rappers, right? So um, they're always present. Um, but I really love the angle your question took about what role does it play in the revision process. Um, I don't know, a buddy of mine, Patrick Rosal, he talks about, again, going back to this uh, metaphor of the DJ, uh, his revision process, you know, where it's really um, sort of a remixing that he's doing all along, right? And I think that I, I think I, I, I take to that as well. You know, you have these poems and you're, you know, what happens if I spin this first and then blend it into that? What happens if I cut and then kind of, you know, uh, join these two things together? So, um, in that sense, you know, maybe using the DJ as a model, uh, the music is uh, playing its way into the revision process. But I really, that's a, a great question. I probably have to give it more thought to be able to give you a, a, an answer that's at all useful. For me, um, so when I, um, 
anytime I think about music and, and specific with this book, um, I'm thinking about um, how I've tried to approximate these different voices and their cadences um, and their ways of saying like Luther Vandross um, and you know certain voices that I've kind of approximated. Again, we're talking about the truth and approximation to the truth. Um, um, for me, uh, I don't think I'm, I guess I think about it in that way. Um, when I'm, when I'm, um, when I'm thinking about who, who is this, um, who is this self that's in this poem? What are, what is this self um, coming up against? Um, and what language does this self need in order to navigate this moment? Um, which takes me a while, especially if it's, especially when it's, um, especially when it's someone specific like Luther Vandross that everyone knows, it's so hard and it's, I'm still scared of those poems, it's so hard. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it comes in, it, I guess I think about it later on in the process, um, of course, I mean, you yeah. know. Um, but yeah, but that's how I think of music in terms of my collection is like, um, it's figuring out um, what these selves need in order to navigate the lyric moment that they're in, um, the situation that they're in, um, what they need in order to um, move to the next step. If the lyric poem can do that, if it allow, you know, can allow you to get out of it, which it really doesn't allow you to get out of it, but yeah. I'll just um, add that uh, I remember Robert Pinsky came to read uh, when I was an undergraduate and in the Q&A afterward he talked about um, being a musician, kind of a, a shitty musician, and uh, which is part of why he moved to poetry. But he said, uh, he said, you have to have two things to be a poet. He said, you have to have an ear. All right. He says, and you can't be stupid. I was like, okay, <laughs> that, seems, that seems like a reasonable That really sounds like him. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like, but that, you know, it was like, of course you have to have an ear. It's like, I, I don't, if, if the ear isn't awake, um, then the poem doesn't live. And, uh, and I think that that's, and I also, you know, uh, the, the question, JJ, I think, uh, uh, you asked about the silence in my book, and I think, um, Again, in another two other quotes, uh, Louise Glick, she says, um, the poem should aspire to silence. And the way I understand that is the poem should, should get to a point where there's nothing left to say, um, which then leads to that Mark Rothko quote, uh, silence is so accurate. Um, so I think that that movement between silence and the ear is, is everything. Um, and, and for me, like that's that's what's leading the the charge is the ear, however subtle it may be. Thank you so much, all of you, for those wonderful questions and answers. That was a really a really great discussion. Thanks for facilitating, Matthew. Um, that was really fantastic. Um, so now I'm going to ask each of the readers to read one final encore poem. Uh, starting with Tommy, if you're ready. And you'll see that we're sharing uh, visuals of these poems this time in case you want to read along. Tommy, are you on mute? I'm, I'm unmuted. Okay. As long as everyone can hear me, you don't need to see me. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. Historical site. Still, it's dark enough this morning that I can see the fireflies going off and on, 
recording what angles the old house's cameras cannot see. Something is watching me. So I keep my distance when I strain my eyes to read the lit plaque to the left of the front door. My eyes are useless. Vision not good enough to parse out what part of history is important enough to warrant bronze foundry. I overheard at Meyer one day that some part of this house was used to hide slaves until nightfall when they'd follow the stars south of here to Canada. As often with history, this house has been restaged. Not even the land it squats on is the original address. The house lifted from its foundation a mile down the road. Yet it makes for a lovely setting for white weddings, picnics, guided tours. I'm afraid of this big house when it is dark like this, when I am dark like this, not a slave. I can read and want to run my finger across the raised lettering, even though that would trigger some alarm, would flood the yard with white light, would signal the police to come, and the police would flood me with white light, so many stars spangling all over me. I'd be the constellation those runaways angled their necks up to, blinking and blinking. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tommy. Woo! That was wonderful. Allison, you want to go next? Yes, I do. Abandon. <clears throat> now the mind is blue and endless, swimming to the bottom of the pool as a child to retrieve a penny, my dark spot. I was alone and dropped it to retrieve it again, a game of devotion or resurrection. The face etched in copper always turned away. Look at me, holding you between my fingers and letting go. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone at Four Way. My, my so love much. to you all. Wonderful. All right, John, you're up. All right. Um, thank you guys again for putting this together. Um, thank you, Allison and Tommy, for reading. You guys are amazing. And thank you, everybody who came out. And this is really cool. I hate technology, but um, this is not so bad. <laughs> mercy, mercy me. Crips, bloods, and butterflies a sunflower somehow planted in the alley, its broken neck. Maybe memory is all the home you get, and rage where you first learn how fragile the axis upon which everything tilts. But to say you've come to terms with a city that's never loved you might be overstating things a bit. All you know is there was once a walk up where now sits a lot vacant and rats in deep grass hide themselves from the day. That one apartment fire set back in 76, one the streets called arson to collect the claim, could not do ultimately what the city itself did, left to its own dank devices some 16 years later. Rebellions said some, Riots said the rest. In any case, flames. And the home you knew, ash. It's not an actual memory, but you remember it still. A rust-bottomed Datsun handed down, then stolen. Stripped, recovered, and built back from bolts. Driving away in May. 1992. What's left of that life quivers in the rear view, the world on fire, and half your head with it. 
Yay. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you again so much to our readers and to Matthew for facilitating. That was really, really great. Thank you, um, Matt. <laughs> Thank and just you, for you to know, all of the um, books by these amazing poets are available on our website. I'll put a link in the chat box. And if you order today or tomorrow with a promo code, you get a discount, um, which I'll also put in the chat box. And the discount is also available for some other select titles, which are listed on the website. So definitely check that out. Um, and as you, some of you may know, we often hold an auction at our benefit. Um, and this year we do have some great items for you yet again, such as tickets to the US Open, gift certificates to restaurants all over New York City, um, and so on and so forth. But instead of doing that tonight, we're gonna wait for a better time to offer these great items when we can appreciate them better. So we'll stay in touch with updates about that. Um, and I just wanted to thank everyone again for, you know, donating for during this difficult time for this event or just out of the goodness of your hearts. And if you haven't donated but wish to and are able to, um, I'm going to have a link there in the chat box as well. It's on our website. Um, and, you know, there's so many ways to support besides financial as well, um, you know, coming to these events, you know, virtually attending, um, buying books, reading books, you know, following us on social media, all those things. So keep up the great work. It means so much. Um, and tomorrow night, there's another reading with Tommy again. Um, and Cynthia Cruz, another one of our amazing authors. Um, Elizabeth T. Gray Jr., another one of our authors who I think is here tonight, um, and Friends of the Press, two amazing uh, writers, Peter Shearson and Helen Fremont, who I think might also be here right now. Um, and they're all reading for another Zoom event, this time for Books Are Magic, which is an amazing independent bookstore here in Brooklyn. Um, so I will put a link to that registration as well in the chat box. Um, and finally, if you have any questions for us, um, we're always here, even in, not in person, virtually. Um, so I'm going to give you a link to our email address so you can reach out to us. Um, and with that said, thank you again so much. And I'm going to turn this back over to Martha Rhodes. Hey, everyone. Oh, am I on mute or did I come off? I'm off here mute. You. Hey. Um, yeah, thank you so much. This was our first ever, and I think I was more nervous about this than the the, the live benefits that have so many more moving parts. Uh, I don't know why. Um, I feel happy. I feel really sad. I feel everything, um, and I think you all do too. Um, but you know, this is how we're going to stay together, and lucky for us that we can do this. So I will see you until next time. And uh, we'll keep you posted. We're planning some great events. Um, talks about Seamus Heaney, uh, The Odyssey, uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, a lot of different things are gonna be happening. So um, we'll keep you posted for sure. You will hear from us. And if you're annoyed by how much you're hearing from us, don't tell me, just sort of delete that particular email because we plan to stay in very good touch um, have a wonderful rest of evening and thank you john allison tommy and all of you for being here with us